So I'm the director of strategy at Health Unlocked. Sort of a funny title, really, but um, I sort of look after the commercial strategy of the company. Um, so we're, we're a startup company still, very much. Um, been going for actually eight years since we started. Uh, so you say, well, it's coming into that maturity phase, but I think really when you're building health technology products, we're just at a stage where we've really landed on a solid commercial model. Building innovation in health is, I think, 10 times harder than, than in other areas because you don't get virality, so it's very hard. People, especially with chronic conditions, they don't know other people with their chronic conditions, but also the customers you're dealing with in healthcare are quite tricky. The NHS is quite tough to, to work with. Um, See, so yeah, I look after the commercial side. We're based, we're headquartered in London. We've got an office in New York as well. There's about 35 of us. The majority of that is product and tech people. Uh, there's a much smaller nine-person operation, which is commercially focused. So where in the system is their new capacity? You see a lot of technology products now, which are about replacing the way something's done. So if you think about Babylon Health or Ada or any of these telehealth type solutions now on your phone, you know. It's the same thing that you did before. You go to see a GP, and you, you went to see the GP, but what we've done is we've changed that interface with a mobile phone. So it's the same thing, but it's, but it's, re it's replacing. So super useful, undoubtedly going to cost, uh, you know, cut costs, and undoubtedly going to be the norm in 10 years, if not five. Um, but, but, but where is their new capacity? Where is their capacity that isn't quite tapped yet within, within that system? Um, this is us, Health Unlocked, um, isn't it? that isn't what we look like. Um, <laughs> we're a safe and validated social network for health, so think LinkedIn and Facebook, but specifically for people with chronic conditions, so we offer anonym, anonymous connectivity to other people suffering the same condition that, that you may have, or the same health interest, be it losing weight or, or learning to run, etc. Um, our network is made up of partnering with organisations. Our bread and butter has always been partnering with patient organisations. So we work with British Heart Foundation, British Lung Foundation, Asthma UK, etc. We cover 160 conditions. This is at a day, actually, we have over 800,000 members. Um, and our size of site is 4.7 a month. So that puts us the second largest health website in the UK, 17th largest globally, um, but, it, but a pretty large website, a pretty, pretty large sort of health site with, with a lot of traffic coming to it. Um, and our company focuses on uh, delivering improved health engagement and outcomes. And we do that through partnerships with charities, payers, and, and also providers. Um, so we've built on partnerships. Um, one area we've had, we've struggled to create virality as a product. So Facebook uh, worked out that if you could get seven friendship requests within three days of you joining the network, you would stay in the network, but you would also bring other people to the network. So it, all the times, I mean, if, if you guys were on Facebook or whenever you joined it, I remember when I joined, people were like, what, you're not on Facebook? You, you, know, you, need to, you need to get onto the platform. So there was this organic pull that made you go there. But in health, it's really tough because if you've got diabetes or you've got COPD or you've got chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you may not know anyone with those same conditions. So how do you say to somebody, hey, come to this platform where you connect? So part of our value proposition is anonymous. So you can be anonymous and therefore free from stigma. Um, but one area we have seen virality is with patient organizations. So uh, our partnerships have expanded. We have 700 patient, sorry, 375 patient organizations. And they, mon they moderate now 700 online communities. So our model has been partnering with them, giving them technology free of charge to, to build you know, solutions that help people. Um, and that's how we've, we've built the platform. So these organizations have brought audience to help unlock, but they've also brought management. So many of our partners have telephone support services with nurses, etc. This is a digital solution that allows them to provide more support to more people. Um, and we partner with companies to leverage this technology to support people through improved engagement, knowledge, skills, and confidence, reducing readmissions to hospitals, increasing adherence, achieving better outcomes, and to create value for HCPs and, and, and patients. Kind of what the platform looks like, I'll just to put you through quick, but you know, you get a homepage, you follow whichever communities um, you may want to follow. There's a range of resources. We're now building education programs as well. You can find other people, follow people, do the stuff you do on a social network. You may want to find people that are geographically close to you. So if I use the example of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, it's a rare blood cancer. 
but the most common of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, you, you're unlikely to know anyone with that same cancer. We have the largest community of people in the world with that condition, and you may want to find people who are geographically close to you. You go to people near me, you put in your postcode, and you'll see uh, in a sort of estimated distance, you know, people that are geographically close to you, etc. So that's the, that's the kind of platform. Um, and we have a very successful partnership with Simply Health, where we've built um, an anonymous peer support community for carers. Um, so this started really a couple of years ago. Uh, discussion started a couple of years ago. I forget actually how long we've been live now. Um, there was some, okay, this is a little bit here, but you can see here this is an online peer support community for carers. And actually, there's not a great offering for carers if you want to connect with other people. Carers UK have a forum, but it's really out of date and um, not particularly well maintained. So this is an online peer support community. We run through that community Ask Me Anything sessions where individuals who are caring for a loved one or somebody they know, they can ask questions to, uh, ask questions to experts who then give them advice through the platform. Um, they can undertake polls and look at their needs. Uh, we also offer an online needs assessment. So it's an active community. It's a place where people connect. People in the platform want to do largely three things. They want to validate how they feel. So is what I feel normal? Do other people feel the same way that I do? We provide that. Um, we also allow people to access services if you want to find personalised services. The platform's built on AI to recommend you content. So if you're looking at content related to a specific drug, medication, etc., we, we can show you more content. Um, and then people want to better manage their condition or manage their situation. And, and that's what they do through others. Um, the community has over 3,000 members. Uh, it's got a real wide age demographic, 18 to 65. Um, top needs, we have a needs assessment, but it's really for carers, independence and activity. Feeling independent, you can kind of relate to that if you're a carer, um, but feeling independent and being able to live an, an active, normal life. And the top need, so the actual category is, is uh, independence and anxiety, but the top need itself is anxiety. So people that are working as carers or being carers, some people who are working as carers, but many of these people are just carers for family members, not, not a designated sort of job status. Um, and the top need within the community is, is people feeling anxious. So I thought I'd just give you a quick sort of look at what, um, what, what we've been doing together. Um, we're safe and validated. Um, so we've been working to make a science of does people connect, do people connecting with other people, does that make a benefit to their healthcare system? Um, so we've asked users every single year, you know, is this worth doing? Are we investing money to create something of value? And what we find is that every year people talk about what the product does for them, and it's mainly these three things. Uh, it's breaking down social isolation, so uh, many people don't know someone with the same condition, so 68% of people are finding someone with the same health condition for the very first time. Uh, people become more confident, um, so they feel more confident managing their condition, 77%. And 54% have better interactions with healthcare professionals, with their doctors. So that's just if you put a survey out and ask users in Health Unlocked what they think, this is what you get back. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it creates a, a, a better outcome. So uh, I don't know if any, does anyone know the patient activation measure? No, this is, um, so the NHS bought 1.8 million licenses of the patient activation measure in 2016. I've got two, uh, 4 million now. Um, what the patient activation measure is, is a tool. It's actually a 13 question survey. Um, and from the way that you answer that survey, it will drop you into one of these uh, four categories of activation. Levels one, overwhelmed and disengaged. Level two, becoming aware but still struggling to manage. It's all about self-management. Uh, three, taking action um, and achieving many behaviours, and then level four is around uh, maintaining behaviours and, and sort of pushing further. So it's a stratification <coughs> tool. How this is being used in um, the public sector is, um, is, is in, in, in GP practice, often it's being given to uh, patients at the point of care, and then they're trying to stratify how you interact with that patient to help them move along this curve. Or what services do you recommend them? Do you recommend them? which local charity services, etc. People using the platform, do they move along that curve? So do they move from becoming low activated, an archetype more like a Homer Simpson, to a high activated patient, more like a Lisa Simpson? So people at the lower levels disengaged, more fatalistic. Can we move them over three months 
uh, to becoming you know, motivated and, and highly engaged. So the University of Manchester have looked at quality of life, patient activation measure, and also a healthcare utilisation survey. And the study was, you know, you join Health Unlocked, and within 48 hours, we give you these three surveys. We take 90 days down the line, and then we give you those same three surveys again, and what's the difference? But no digging in further than that, just did they access the service and did they move? Um, and what we found is that they, they do. So if you look at the UK population, the UK population is 40% fall into levels <coughs> one and two, and 60% of people fall into levels three and four. Um, so you might think, well, a social network for health, by very definition, is going to have activated patients. So um, you know, they're, they're going to be you know, highly motivated to come to a network and sign up. Well, actually, 33% of the people that join the platform um, fell into those lower levels of activation, meaning there's an opportunity to, to move them. It's not that far from the real world. Over a three-month period, we saw them move 5.8 points on average, so across about 10 conditions. This was a hit, it hit statistical significance. Manchester will publish on this in July. Um, so it, it moved 5.8 uh, points, um, and what you saw is that there was a 31% drop in the first two levels. So the lower levels of activation dropped by 31%. Now, we've used this as proxy data to look at, okay, well, what is the actual health economic outcome? So, I mean, take this with a pinch of salt, but um, depending on what study you look at, there's a 9% reduction in, in, in inpatient admissions in hospitals. So, what's interesting about the patient activation measure is that it's been referenced and used in over 300 academic journals, and a lot of those studies are looking at, you know, people and what level they are versus the actual cost in the healthcare system using... Uh, electronic health records, etc. Um, so, depending on which study you look at, it, it, would, it would imply uh, a nine percent drop in, in in inpatient admissions. So, how are social networks themselves being used in health right now? You've probably never heard of Health Unlocked unless you're involved in the project we have. Um, well, increasingly, I think. Um, so, HCPs themselves. If this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was a survey delivered to 601 senior executives in the states. And what this was looking at was kind of clinical leaders, senior clinicians, uh, providers, and also payers, so insurers in, in the US. Everyone's called a payer over there if you're an insurer. So they, they were asked, what are the three situations that are most useful? So where are, where are health social networks most useful in care delivery? Uh, as chronic disease is you know, pacing resources, you can see 85% say, well, in chronic disease management, there's a huge, huge opportunity. 78% uh, say within the promotion of healthy behaviors, that's quit smoking, change your lifestyle, start running, etc. cetera. Uh, and then the other 41% is in emotional support. So you know, actually supporting people emotionally after they leave the, the clinic or leave, leave the room. Um, and then they were asked, well, wh wh when they mature, where are they going to have the most impact? So when asked, where, where are they going to, what's the impact they're going to have when they mature? It's largely in patient engagement and also quality of life. So that's the perceived healthcare system view of where social networks for health are going. Um, but what's actually happening in, and, and the way social networks or our product, I'm just talking about us really here, but it, ha how is our product being, being used? Uh, to integrate, so if you go online and you search, I don't know how you guys search, but you know nowadays people search increasingly for long tail searches. You literally write, you know, uh, how do I manage this exact thing that I have? Um, but a lot of people come to NHS Choices when they search the web. So about 50 million people a month come to NHS Choices, and what you find here is that uh, this is just a couple of examples, but. When you're on their platform, you'll see that this content, these forums or communities are being signposted directly from NHS Digital Asset. So trying to provide information and then navigation to a place where you can get a niche service like Health Unlocked. Um, so that's one way that they're being used, um, which links them through to an online community where they can get support uh, from the crowd. So we partner with the National Health Service. We've built communities in weight loss, and also um, Couch to 5K, which is a very popular running program, um, as well as Healthy Eating, uh, Strength and Flex, which is another program, there's about five that we do with the NHS. Um, 
we also are working with organisations and, um, and the healthcare system to navigate services. So the, the charity partners that I, dis I spoke about earlier, they, they have online communities, but they also upload services into Health Unlocked and into our database. And what we do on local websites such as Healthwatch is allow users to input their condition and also their postcode and then receive a series of recommendations uh, for health. And that might be a local support group that's available to you, physical support group to connect with people, uh, editorial content, an online community, um, a personal story, etc. Um, so making, making recommendations that exist in these ecosystems available in external environments. Prescribed at the point of care, so this is relatively new, it's a real uh, bullet in the head trying to get this done. Um, but this is now in North East London, if you go to a GP, you can now be prescribed social support and, and social communities directly by your GP in their electronic health records. So about 60% of GP practices use some software called EMIS. Um, and this is a plug-in into EMIS. So a GP is able to sit there with a the patient, understand from them, give them a simple needs assessment, understanding common conditions and the common needs that that person in front of them may have. Simply select, put it all in a shopping basket, and generate a group of recommendations and then input the email of, that, uh, of, of the patient into, into the system and send it. Um, so, so, so this is how it's being used in, in GPs. We're planning to roll this out further. Uh, but we've been focusing on making sure that we get the uptake at a local level and then looking to expand. And then I thought I'd just put in here, right near the end now really, um, but what does the future of insurer-delivered peer support look like? Um, and this I'm going to just talk about what we're doing in the States, because I think it's quite relevant and you know, it, it may connect, it may not. But um, what we're doing in the US is, is working with large insurers to help their patient populations manage themselves better and reduce their cost. So in order to bring that to life, I'll just sort of talk through you know, a real example. So this is Maria on the, on the left-hand side. Maria is she's got three, stage three kidney disease. There's four main stages in kidney disease. You start costing a lot of money when you get to the end of the line. Um, age 42, married with two children, works for a large corporate, and she's on the phone with the nurse team at, uh, at, her, pro at her health plan provider. Now, if you end up on dialysis as a kidney disease patient in the States, you cost on average $18,000 per week. So the cost racks up super quick. Um, so you, you really want to stop people getting to that stage if you're a business. So anyway, Maria's on the phone with the nurse team. So the nurse is on the phone. And the nurse has a portal that she opens up in front of her. It's part of her workflow, but on the phone with, with that patient. Um, so Maria's on the phone with, with one of the plans nurse. Now the, the nurse is able to select based on her conversation with Maria and knowing uh, what condition she has, select a screener to say what category does she fall into. And it could be simply uh, what type of uh, kidney disease does she have, but it could be other factors as well. It takes information directly from Maria. And based on that recommendation, the nurse is then able to recommend a program to Maria. So this is the nurse's view still. The nurse just adds in Maria's email address. She puts it into the web tool and sends an email straight to Maria. So she's been on the phone. Hey Maria, I've got a really great recommendation for a kidney disease program. Let me send it to you. Would you like to receive that? Anyway, at this point Maria gets an email. She comes through with she's got Gmail or whatever. Anyway, um, so she receives a program via email, comes through and it says, hey, join the, join the kidney disease community that's available for you. But important to note, this community is run by a non-profit, it's run by a charity that also has a telephone a support service and a range of other educational services. So Maria C, uh, receives the, the recommendation via email. She's invited, she clicks on the link and she lands on the relevant community that is relevant for her based on the stage of her kidney disease. We have four communities with this charity partner. Inputs her email and her username 
and she's welcomed into the network where she can find lots of communities, lots of experiences and lots of useful things. So Maria comes to the platform and she sees her homepage, which is relatively static from the first time of entry. Um, she's given recommendations for who to follow, different tri uh, kidney disease, uh, you know, different uh, tags and information. If she clicks on any of these links, it'll take her to an aggregated page of content. Um, but she also has her hub where she can connect with both uh, the kidney disease community, where she can connect with other people, but also an education program which is delivered as, as online education uh, directly through, through the network. So Maria can click on that and see the community itself, so she can go to the National Kidney Foundation's community, a relatively large patient organisation, turn over about $55 million US. They're not small in terms of charities and PAGs, but they're not the largest either. So she goes to the community and she checks, out, um, she checks, she checks it out. Uh, she reads a post, reads someone else's experience, and as she reads that post and comes to the bottom, she's targeted and signposted with super useful and relevant content. Now this is a program which is delivered through Health Unlocked. This is the next stage of our journey, is building education into the platform. Um, so it'll be featured content, it's a program uh, that, that's been authored by the National Kidney Foundation. So she clicks on the link, and we haven't built the program yet, so I'll show you another one. Um, which is the British Heart Foundation, but Maria can jo join this page, she can enrol into that education program and then be sent online education over a series of time, um, such as this, and uh, we're in the process of building the other pieces, but this, I mean, this is live right now. And to give you a little case study of that, I mean, this is the community, um, so this is an online peer support community, it's moderated and administered by the National Kidney Foundation's trained specialists. It's a core service that's aligned to link to something called NKF Cares, which is a telephone support line, again, with nurses and trained specialists in kidney disease. Our technology provides the, the community, the services integration, and everything that you see in the network, the hosting, all of that. And an average user in this community, just to put it in context, um, they come to the platform 26 times in a given month, consume 58 pages and stay for just under two minutes and 20 seconds. So that's about just under an hour a month that somebody's coming and connecting over their disease and their condition, which is when you then sign post really useful content and information. Um, so this is real, I can't tell you who the national payer is in the US, but um, I should be able to announce it at some point in the not too distant. Um, but we've just put pen to paper on our, on our first deal in the US, which is exactly what I've just shown you. So um, it's not live as of yet, but um, it certainly will be. And how that works is that the payer has found the people of the highest cost and stratified them in their, in, in their health records. Uh, they then signpost, they have signposting mechanisms, they can send emails, they can send posts, everything's still done in posts in the US. Um, uh, patients are screen segmented, so they, they're segmented by the nurse or in their own flow. They come into an online community, they connect with other people, and they can sign up to relevant education. And then the interesting piece here is that we're actually measuring that. So we're measuring that by looking at the patient activation measure and giving that every, I think it's every three months, we give the, the patient activation measure to see whether people are moving along that curve. But we're also tracking linking in to the healthcare record on the payer side, so on the insurer's side. Um, there's a huge flow and lots of information governance work, and it's, you know, it's been pretty tough going, um, but we're pretty much there with, with all of that now, um, where we'll track that as endpoints. So what we're really looking to do is say, do a cohort that exists in the platform, do they cost less than a cohort outside of the platform? If we nail that, then I, th then I think we're done. I mean, I think, I think we're okay for, uh, for, for the rest of our uh, rest of our lifetime. Um, and then we're estimating cost savings using the patient activation measure as a proxy to say, well, actually, what would the cost be? So if we were able to move people 5.8 points along that curve, what does the cost saving come, come out as? Now, these guys, this insurer, in their book, in their book, it's... Um, They've, got, they've basically got different types of customers. They've got customers for the government that cost them, that they don't get paid as much for, but then they've got the employer side of the book, which is where you really make the money in the, in the States. Um, so what we're looking at is 8,000 8, 8, patients in, 
looking at improvement of parent score, net promoter score as well, um, and intent um, to transplant, and then overall cost savings. And we're estimating we'll make uh, one and a half million in cost reductions for them. I think finally I'll just say, you know, what does, the, I'm trying to pull all those disparate things together, but what does the future of online patient support look like? And I'm talking really a lot patient rather than person, but person-led support and what, what's actually happening in the world. Well, I think increasingly people are going to be found in online ecosystems that cater for their needs. So most people search the web, they might search for a Google search, land on NHS Choices, and on NHS Choices, on average, you'll look at 1.7 pages per visit. So if you, if you, if you go to, 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 to NHS Choices, so you look at a couple of bits and then you bounce and you go to another website. Um, Increasingly, I think these kinds of, as you can see, where they have sort of a, 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 a widget for health and lot that links you off to another service, links you off to a forum. Increasingly, I think those things are going to come together. I mean, even this morning, I booked the flight to the to the U.S. for my next trip, and I've used already this morning loads of niche services to meet my needs. So I use Skyscanner for the flight, and then used Airbnb for the accommodation, and then I use Zipcar in order to book a car so that I can drive around. Um, all of those niche services that are gonna help me do whatever I need to do, but I think increasingly the world is gonna come and start bringing these services together. Um, so there'll be much more integration of different platforms. We see a lot of companies that want to integrate more with other platforms, um, and we encourage that, but increasingly that's what's gonna happen, is that these, these services which now dovetail, like it did for me earlier with Skyscanner and uh, Airbnb, they're going to start to integrate much, much, much deeper. But what does that mean for patients or people with the health condition is that self-management itself will become easier. Um, so what I mean by that is that when you cater for all of those needs in an intelligent way and start bringing an ecosystem around them to find useful information, personalized, segmented, etc., that's going to give people more tools and information to better self-manage. So what you're going to see is a, a blending of services come together and then what you're going to see is that those services help people make informed decisions better. Um, and I, I, I think we're, we're seeing that certainly with the, the way that, that we operate. And the final thing is that I think big players are going to become increasingly interested in those ecosystems. So if I think about the NHS that's interested in prescribing services like ours at the point of care or, in, or American insurers that want to push people into the network, increasingly these ecosystems are going to have, I think, more of a prominent role and big players are going to become interested um, in them and that's, that's, that's increasingly, ha uh, increasingly happening. Um, and that's, that's it, that's, that's, that's the presentation.